Well, good morning and welcome to Parkhead Nazarene and the New Charter Online. It's Sunday the 16th of August. I'm Ian Wells, one of the pastors in our church, and we're delighted you've joined us as we worship together. Well, last week we shared a little about what church would look like in the immediate future. Uh, the ongoing restrictions on churches meeting for worship means that the shape of the church will be, well, a little different. We're keeping our Sunday services online, as you can see, but really we're focusing on life groups and small groups of people who can gather together. And these smaller groups of 8 to 12 people uh, are meeting online on Zoom, but also now in person at the church with appropriate social distancing, uh, face coverings, hygiene measures and all of that. So all in line with government guidelines. Now, if you listened into last week's service, you'll know that we see this as an opportunity rather than a constraint, believing that this could be a season where we find God doing something new with us and something new in us at a point when perhaps we feel stretched or uncertain about what's happening around us. And so we want to embrace this focus on smaller groups and on discipleship in those smaller groups. On the Alpha course, leaders and helpers go through some training. And one of the things they look at is the difference between the talk or the sermon and the small discussion groups. Nikki Gumbel describes it along these lines. The talk of the sermon is like taking a jug of water and trying to throw it out over a table of glasses, hoping that some of it drops into each glass. And some might and others may miss it. But in the small group, they allow us to pour very gently and specifically truth and faith and love and understanding and help and support into the lives of one another as we share together in those smaller groups. I love that picture. And of course, we said last week that this is the model of discipleship and gathering of people that, that Jesus invests in most of the time. Just a small group of people. And so we feel we're in good company when we focus in this direction on smaller groups. And so I hope you'll get connected with a life group. And if you'd like to, then please contact us on Facebook or email us at parkhead.nazarene.org.uk or just send a text message to one of the pastors. Now, it was out of this kind of small group that the early disciples began to operate and reach out into their world. And in fact, the early church was full of this kind of small group. And so we wanted to do a new series, this time on the book of Acts, uh, the book that really maps out the journey of those early disciples as they too begin to see God doing new things among them and around them. And as they respond both to what Jesus had taught them and what he had done for them in the cross and the resurrection. And so today is a new series. And I hope you're ready to learn from the early church about what it means to be Jesus' disciples. Now, just one last thing before we pray. We've also mentioned that we are hosting some small worship gatherings up to around 25 at the church for either a prayer service or a teaching service. We've had three already, but the next two services will be on Sunday the 23rd of August at 4 p.m. and then Monday the 31st of August at 7.30 p.m. Both services will be at Burger Street and again you have to sign up for these, so please register if you plan to attend. Uh, those services, either through Facebook, email or text. Same details as before. Well, let's pray as we enter into this time of worship and learning and growing in faith together. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, you are Lord of the church, Lord of our lives, Lord of the heavens, Lord of the earth, Lord over all. And you invite us to proclaim you as Lord in everything we do, everything we say. Thank you that our lives have been made new in you. Your love has captured our hearts. Your death has given us life. Your resurrection has overcome all things. And we declare you, Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we worship today, we pray that you would give us greater revelation of who you are and what you long to do in us and through us. May your word inspire us as well as instruct us. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to become more like Jesus as his followers and disciples, living in and sharing out his love. And Father God, we know that this is your plan and purposes for us. And so we submit our lives to you 
and your ways. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. to eat. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. 
he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard me to speak about. For John baptised you with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this tip? Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay. Well, thanks to Kim for reading the opening verses of the book of Acts as we start this new series. The book of Acts was written by Luke, who was also the writer of the gospel named after him, creatively named the Gospel of Luke. Having recorded the life of Jesus in his gospel, Luke now writes about what happens next with this ragtag bunch of disciples that Jesus had pulled together to be his friends, his followers, and now, as we read, his witnesses as Jesus returns to the Father. In the last few lines of Luke's gospel, Jesus meets with his disciples for the last time before he's taken up to heaven, what we call his ascension. And he gives them some final instructions about what it means to be his witnesses. And amazingly, we find the disciples not distressed at Jesus leaving, as they had been before, but now worshipping with joy as they return to Jerusalem to wait for the next instalment of God's plan for them. After all the anxiety and sorrow following Jesus' death, and then their disbelief and confusion about his resurrection, the disciples' final encounter with the risen Christ is one of worship and joy before they're led into the next chapter of their lives as followers and witnesses of Jesus. They'd been in the midst of a personal and collective crisis, but it was worship that became the threshold, the doorway from crisis to purpose. And the book of Acts outlines that new purpose. And so before we launch into the book of Acts, I, I think it's utterly essential for us to understand that worship is at the heart of who we are as the people of God. Worshipping God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, with all that I am and all that I have. And it is from the heart and life of worship, that place and posture of worship, that we're changed, we're made whole, we're renewed and we're readied for what's next. Our response to God and to what he's done in Christ and the Holy Spirit is one of worship. And when we worship, we're really giving our whole selves to God, no matter what. And that is the starting point for how God will shape us, fill us and use us for the next instalment or chapter, the next doorway of our lives. And as we worship, our vision and knowledge and awareness of God will increase. We'll have greater revelation of who he really is. And as that happens, we will want to worship more. And that will make all the difference in the world when it comes to being his witnesses. As we declare his goodness, his glory, his love, his power, his mercy, his work, and his name. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ.
Well, in the passage that Kim read to us earlier, we find Jesus giving these instructions to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you or fills you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Some of us will have been in courtrooms more than we would have liked and for reasons we'd rather forget. For others, we've fulfilled our civic duty when we've been invited to be jurors on a particular court case. But perhaps some of us have had to be witnesses in a courtroom where we've been asked to give evidence about something we've witnessed, what we saw or heard or experienced about a situation or an event or a person. And the role of the witness is to speak the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about what we've witnessed. Witnesses give testimony to the truth. Well, in these verses, Jesus is saying, be my witnesses. Tell the truth about who I am and what I've done so that the world can know me. I'm not even sure he's asking them, can I get a witness? He's telling them, you will be my witnesses. It seems like the assumption is that if you're a follower of Christ filled with the Holy Spirit, then the natural outcome is that you will be his witness. In other words, your life will be characterised by pointing people towards Jesus, both in what you see and in what you do. It's all about Jesus. You know, I love our church. We have a great church. I love that we have great people, great ministries and programmes, great life groups, great love, great laughter, great characters. But in the end, it's only ever and always about Jesus. We're not called to be witnesses to the church, wonderful though it may be, we're witnesses to Jesus. Because no matter how wonderful the church is, we're not as wonderful as Jesus. We're his witnesses, which is why we need to know Jesus more and more in our lives as we talk with him and listen to him in prayer, as we encounter him and are in awe of him in worship, as we learn and discover new truths about him in the Bible, as we explore with others the deeper things of Christ. In Acts chapter 4, 13, the thing that strikes the religious leaders most about the disciples is not their status or education or intellect, but rather that they'd been with Jesus. It's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3, 8 that he considered everything rubbish, dung, in comparison to knowing Christ. It's all about Jesus. We're his witnesses. And that means we need to know him and keep close to him day by day. But there are some things about Jesus that Luke mentions that seem essential for Jesus' witnesses. Things that Jesus himself highlighted. The first is a reference back to the life and teaching of Jesus that he captures in his gospel. 
In Acts chapter 1 verse 1, Luke simply calls it all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And that's almost exactly what Jesus says to the disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel, where he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have taught or commanded you. When we are witnesses, we talk about the amazing things that Jesus taught and did, not only in the lives of the disciples, but now also in our own lives. And Jesus taught not only with words, but with actions. I love the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, when the younger son disappears off with his father's inheritance, leaving his family behind, devastated and dishonoured. He squanders the lot, finds himself desperate, debates whether to return home because of the shame he feels. But finally, he makes the journey back. And as he approaches the father's house to his home, To his surprise, the father is running to meet him, throws his arms around him, welcomes him home, restores his place in the family and throws a party. Now that's not just what Jesus taught, that's what Jesus did as well. The Gospels are loaded with occasions and examples of Jesus welcoming the unlikeliest of people back to himself and to his heavenly father. But I love it because it's my story too. I'm not just bearing witness to something that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago or something he practiced with a few individuals way back then. I'm his witness because this is what he does and this is what he's like and this is who he is. And this is who he is with me and with you. But we also bear witness to what he taught and did in all kinds of other ways as well. What he had to say about life and money and relationships or hatred and anger or love, what he had to say about worry, or death, or despair. Why? Why are we witnesses to these things? Because he teaches things that are life-changing in all of these areas, and in many other areas too. I witness to him and to what he says because they are real and true and life-giving. And so when I think about being a witness to Jesus, I'm a witness to, to all that he did and all that he taught, not just in the lives of those in the Gospels way back, but in my life too. All that he is doing and teaching in my life, in our lives, and what he wants to do and teach in every life.
Well, the second thing that Luke mentions as he introduces this sequel to his gospel is that he points back to Jesus' death and resurrection. Acts 1.3 says, After his suffering, that is Jesus' death, he showed himself to those men, the disciples, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Well, the cross and the resurrection are at the heart of the Christian message, and therefore they are at the heart of our witness to Christ. Everything changes at the cross and the empty tomb. I'm a fixer. Uh, I want to fix everything and everyone. The problem is I'm a terrible fixer. I remember being at a Rend Collective concert and they were talking about the word Christian. Uh, the message was simple. Everything about being a Christian is about Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's done for us in the cross and the resurrection. Um, he went on, if you take Christ out of the word Christian, all you're left with is Ian. And he's no use to anyone. Well, there was a great deal of laughter all around the people I was with, my friends, family, my wife, and far too much uh, agreement for my liking as well. But the fact of the matter is this. It's absolutely true. In fact, the real truth is that I need rescued. I need rescued from myself, from the broken condition I find myself in, I need rescued from the separation that exists between humanity and God, me and God. I need rescued from the sin that so easily entangles my life. And while I can try my best to do the right thing, and I do, I can't fix all of this in the way that it needs fixed, the way I need fixed. Only Christ can do that. And the starting point is the cross and the resurrection, where all the brokenness and sin of life is buried with Christ's death and is overcome in his resurrection. We need that. And at the cross and the empty tomb, we find forgiveness, healing, life, hope, peace, love, power, strength. Because there, Jesus deals with the human pandemic that we call sin. A pandemic that affects every person in every generation and every nation. It is the cross and the resurrection of Christ that makes all the difference. Here, we are brought back to God when we couldn't get there ourselves. I can't fix it. You can't fix it. Only Christ can fix it. And he fixed it on the cross and the resurrection. This is a powerful, life-changing event and message to which we are witnesses. Not because we were there at the cross or the empty tomb like the early disciples, but because we've experienced and encountered its reality and power. Our lives have been changed as we accept what Christ has done on the cross, as we give up our life to him. I have died with Christ, says the Apostle Paul. But in doing so, we have also been resurrected to a new life in Christ. And as I was preparing all this, I found myself tangibly lifting in my heart and spirit because I could recall not only my own story of spiritual resurrection in Christ, but yours too. We have literally watched people's lives being resurrected by Christ, lifted out of the mess and at times death of sin and given a new life, that born again kind of life that Jesus spoke about. And each of us needs that new spiritual birth. But of course, there's one more thing about the death and resurrection of Jesus that we bear witness to, and that's the message and the hope of eternal life. Death does not have the final word. The grave is not the end, but rather Christ has overcome even death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We've had to face our own share of sadness and loss in the last few months. And this week we heard the sad news that Susan Chong had passed away. What do we say in such difficult circumstances? That that's it? Life was what it was and then death? Oh, God forbid. No, we stand in the hope of eternal life because for those who are in Christ, there is the promise of eternal life. That death is not the final chapter because Christ has overcome the grave. And in that future life, we are made whole and free and the things that held us here cannot hold us there. And we are to be witnesses to this hope, rooted in the resurrection of Jesus. Not because we stood at the empty tomb, 
And not because we've seen heaven or been there, but because Jesus has promised it to those who believe in him. And because our encounter with the risen Christ confirms its truth. We are witnesses to all Jesus did and taught and continues to do and teach in our lives. And we are witness to his death and resurrection, which has given us new life and eternal life. But there's one more thing that Luke mentions to which we are witnesses. Something that Jesus speaks of often, the kingdom of God. That's what Luke highlights in Acts chapter 1 when he writes about Jesus appearing to his disciples after the resurrection. That over a period of 40 days before he returned to the Father, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And in many ways, the kingdom of God captures everything about God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God represents the way in which God operates and works and reigns as the sovereign creator and sustainer of heaven and earth. It represents how he loves us and longs for relationship with us. It represents the perfect ways of God that are for our good. We can't improve on what the Apostle calls, uh, Paul calls God's good, pleasing and perfect will. If we think of a kingdom ruled by a king, then we think about the way that the king uses his power and authority. How the king rules over the people. What kind of king is he? What laws does he put in place? Do they help or do they hinder people? Do they bring life or steal life? Do they establish justice or do they contribute to injustice? Is this a king of compassion or cruelty, of mercy or judgment, of hope or oppression? Well, in the New Testament, it is Jesus who is identified as Lord and King. And so what kind of Lord and King is he? He's one who serves the people, who sees the forgotten, who welcomes the outsider. He heals the brokenhearted. He loves the unloved. He stands against injustice. One who responds with mercy, who leads with humility, who pushes back evil and establishes good, who comforts and brings peace, who strengthens and gives hope. This is the king who loves us so much that he gave up his life for his people. His ways are perfect. His reign is righteous. His rule is just. His kingdom is good because he is good. His power, and he is powerful, is expressed in love, in mercy and in grace. It is to this king and to this kingdom that we are witnesses. Folks, this is good news and good news for all. Good news for the world. And Jesus says, be my witnesses and let the world know what I can do and let them know what I've done in you. Victory.
I love baptismal services. We've had plenty of them over the years as we've celebrated with many who have experienced the new resurrection life that Jesus brings to us. In our church, most of our baptisms are by immersion. That is, those who are being baptised are fully immersed, often backwards, into the water so that they are covered from head to toe. They are totally submerged by the water, consumed by it as a sign of their complete abandonment to Jesus and their desire to be flooded and filled with his life. We've often likened baptism to what happens when you put a sponge in water. The first thing you notice is that as you push down, the sponge becomes surrounded by the water. But then as you hold it there, something else begins to happen. The water begins to soak into the sponge. So that not only is the sponge in the water, but the water is in the sponge. The sponge is consumed and filled by the water. As Jesus speaks to his disciples about being witnesses, he knows that they can't do it on their own. 
They need help. They need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if they are to become his witnesses. And he draws on the image of baptism. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist got his name because he spent a lot of time baptizing people in the waters of the River Jordan. It represented the outer cleansing and purity of a person. But Jesus speaks of a deeper internal baptism here, when the life of a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the difference between the sponge being in the water and the water being in the sponge. It's one thing to believe that God is around us and with us. It's something rather different to know that God has filled us and is within us. To know that our life has been filled with his life. That our spirit has been made new by God's spirit. Baptised. Filled with the spirit. And Jesus instructs the disciples that this is a gift they need to receive so that they can be his witnesses and live as God intended us to live. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us power to live for Christ and to be his witnesses. In fact, when we live lives that are filled with the Spirit, we can't help but be Christ's witnesses. The Spirit brings a new power and energy and vitality to our life that propels us outwards to share what Jesus has done for us in both word and action. And as we do so, we're bearing witness to all that Jesus had said and done, to his death and resurrection, to that life-changing death and resurrection, and to the kingdom of God, which God is lovingly establishing on earth as it is in heaven. Our witnessing has wide-ranging influence. Jesus says to the disciples that they will be witnesses not just in their home city of Jerusalem, but onwards to the wider region of Judea and Samaria, and then across the world, which is of course what we see happening in the book of Acts and across the last 2,000 years of the church's history. And in every generation of the church, in every era, the followers of Jesus must once again know what it is to be filled with the Spirit so that they too might receive power to be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Jesus really does have a better way for the world, but who will bear witness to it? Who will point the world to Jesus and this better way? Who will live out and speak out the truth of Jesus and his kingdom? It's not always easy to be Christ's witnesses. It costs, and Jesus knew that. And so he doesn't leave his disciples or us on our own. But instead, the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out for all. And those who seek and ask and wait to be filled, they will find and receive the power to be his witnesses and to declare and share his goodness and praise. It's all about Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Great are you, Lord.
After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intensely up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood behind him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then he returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constant prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen. Over June and July, we preached through a series on prayer based on the book How to Pray by Pete Gregg, and many of us also tied into the prayer course, which our life groups have been working through during the week. And honestly, we have had really great feedback about it all. And prayer is really the life breath of the Christian. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for breath is ruach. It's a beautiful word. I love it. And it's used to speak of the life-giving breath of God. But it's also used for the word wind, the wind of God, and also for the word spirit, the spirit of God, ruach, breath. Wind, spirit. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the place we find the disciples as they wait for the Ruach of God is in the place of prayer, the life breath of the Christian. Prayer invites the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God to fill us. And then we are sent out to be his witnesses in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the movement of Christian living and witnessing. We come to Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the place of worship and prayer, where we give our praise and honour to God and where we receive his life, his word, his spirit. And from there, in that place of prayer and worship, from the presence and power and purity of the Holy Trinity, we are sent out from them as witnesses. And the reason we took eight weeks to focus on prayer is because it's essential foundational, critical to the life of the disciple of Jesus. We cannot live this life without prayer and the Holy Spirit, and we were never intended to. You know, often the book of Acts is referred to as the Acts of the Apostles, and I understand why. It records the story of those early apostles and disciples as they stepped out in faith as Jesus' witnesses, and as they spoke and acted in the ways that Jesus did. They were different people from the disciples that were in crisis following Jesus' death. But I wonder if it would be equally appropriate to talk of the book of Acts as the acts of the Spirit or the acts of God, because it's really God who's at work in and through and around the disciples as they live in obedience to all that Jesus had said and done. It's really the Spirit that is at work in them as they bear witness to Jesus' death and resurrection. It's the Spirit who works as they share the good news of the gospel of Christ and the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit fills you, and you will be my witnesses. Can I get a witness? Shall we pray? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you will be filled to the measure of all, the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be the glory and the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. 
Amen. the grace of 
So 